Our lesson today is going to be about the gift of worship. The gift of worship. And this whole series this month has been about God's holiness and ours. See that up there? Um, it's really not ours. It's his that manifests itself yes. through us. And I talked a little bit about that last week, how God is separate from everything and everyone else always has been and always will be. He is ultimately holy. All holiness emanates from him. But in our life unto him, we are separated unto him. And that's how our holiness uh, fits in that picture. Um, today's lesson, the gift of worship, is going to, it's really about holiness. And I'm going to try to get into that just a little bit. So Matthew chapter 2, the focus verse today says, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him. Matthew chapter 6. Now I'm going off, I'm going off the sheet here. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. Who knows who's saying this? And where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 2 Corinthians 4 and 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Amen. You may be seated. I see some concerned looks. I'm not going to preach three messages today. Hallelujah. John moped along on the rugged jungle path, sloshing through muddy, stinking puddles and swatting at the hordes of pesky mosquitoes attempting to eat him alive. Christmas, he grumbled under his breath. Some Christmas this was. It didn't feel like Christmas. It was too hot, too humid, too miserable. Christmas was supposed to be merry, but John couldn't bring any sort of cheer into his mood at the present. He's being a Grinch, ain't he? He was thinking of how unfestive his current state was when he mistakenly stepped into a deeper puddle, sinking knee-deep into black mud. I hope Brother Chad ain't having to deal with that right now. That does it, he yelled and continued to grumble as he began jerking on his leg, trying to pull it out of the hole. It would be snowing at home. The soft flakes would still be piling up at mounds outside their kitchen window. They would bake cookies, make snowmen, and sing joy to the world at the top of their lungs. His family would travel from across the state to eat and to tell stories, and the children would giggle as they unwrap presents. That's what Christmas is supposed to be like, John thought. Not this, not stuck out in the middle of nowhere in a jungle complete with monkeys and palm trees. The thought made John shudder more deeply, and he began to stomp with added emphasis, slowing down his pace, but increasing the dents his boots were making into the soft earth. Then as if he thought, just, just as if the thought had occurred to him for the first time, he sputtered out, and on top of all this, we have church tonight. Urgh. Now John loved church. He had dedicated his life to be a minister, but on this day, the thought of a church service seemed to be more than he could bear. John had been in this foreign land for nine months now. He had come with his wife and their young son. He had been part of missions before, but now he was tired. He was discouraged. 
His son missed grandma. Can I get a witness today? And he wanted to be home for Christmas. He said a quick prayer for strength as he opened the door to the place where they were living, greeted his family, and immediately began to dress for church. During the service, John began to pray for a young man who was new to the church. The young man told John that he felt something special. He felt love, and he needed that feeling in his life. John began to explain the feeling to the young man, and soon he was speaking in tongues as God filled him with his spirit. In that moment, John's heart was changed and comforted as he heard God speaking to him. God brought to John's mind the memories of his calling and the burden God had given him for others. John began to feel peace knowing that being able to witness lives changed and being part of people experiencing God was greater than any tradition. Like John, we are called to give back to God, worshiping Him with our lives and allowing Him to use us to bring hope, joy, and love to others. Now, if you remember what I taught last week, that's why this fits hand in hand with what holiness is. We are meant to worship God with our lives. Worship is the outward expression of our faith. Worship is the outward expression of our faith. In James chapter 2, verse 20, we read that faith without works is dead. So what is our response when we believe and when we experience God's Spirit? In Matthew's account of the Christmas story, he wrote about a group of wise men who traveled from the east to find Jesus. They had seen his star and by faith began to follow it, searching for the king of the Jews, Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. They were looking for him. They seen his sign. And they were looking for him. I want to remind us, the signs are all around us right now. Now is the time to be looking for Jesus to come again. They continued to follow the star until they came to where Jesus was. The Bible says when they saw young Jesus, they fell down and worshipped him. The wise men believed that the star would lead them to whom they sought. And when they came into the presence of the Messiah, they were compelled to to worship him. As is displayed in the Christmas story, worship is the natural outward expression of our faith. When we experience the wonder of God, our eyes are open to his majesty and to his splendor, and then we worship him. Why don't we just do that right now, Lord Jesus, again? We worship you, Lord, today, God. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Lord. We love you, God, with all of our hearts today, O oh Lord. Thank you, God, for allowing me to be a servant, Lord, in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me, God, to know you and to have the privilege, Lord, of being at church today, O oh God. We love you, Lord, with all of our hearts today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We humble ourselves before God when we worship Him. Christmas is a time when we give gifts to the people that are close to us. Gift giving, if you've ever read the book, The Five Love Languages, it'll explain this to you. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's a good book. Gift giving is recognized as a love language. When we receive gifts, we have to receive them what happens if you tell someone, ah, I don't want, are you re-gifted or you take it back to Walmart? It's not a very good look, right? We have to receive the gifts. But when we receive it, we feel loved by the giver. We give gifts to others to show our appreciation for them, to show that we care enough about them, to sacrifice our resources for them. And because we know that receiving gifts produces happiness in the recipient. Christmas is a time when we are thankful for the ones that we love. And as a result, we act by giving gifts. 
But during the holidays, how many of us stop long enough to think about what can I give to God? There are so many stores that are banking on. I mean, it started now, it's not even Black Friday. Now it's Black uh, October, November, and December. <clears throat> it's online shopping. It's I, I'm telling you, it was eerie when I went to Walmart on Black Friday. There wasn't anybody in. They had pallets and stuff piled around. Nobody was in there. You know why? Because they had already done their shopping online. But we, and all that's, uh, we understand this, okay? I'm not saying that we don't. But do we take the time to stop to think about what can I give to God during this time of recognizing Him? God, as we talked about many of weeks, God is a generous giver. God is a generous giver. Giver. When we give back to God through worship, we must humble ourselves in reverence to and before Him. Offering of everything that we offer to Him is an act of our worship. You ever notice when, uh, if you will analyze and I'm not telling you to do that, but for lack of a better word, but when we look at people, we can tell what they worship. Because what they worship is manifesting itself through their life. Right. So it's the same thing with us as believers. What we offer to God will be a manifestation of who and what we worship. One way we worship God in humility is by our giving. Not only did the wise men bow down in reverence to Jesus, but they brought him gifts. Matthew 2.11 says, When they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Worship for God comes from our hearts, but our actions show the manifestation of of that worship. The wise men gave of their riches, and the shepherds left their flocks to glorify God. When we are submitted to God, we are willing to give up the things that we believe are important to honor God. I want to pause right there and let you know why I read the scripture text that I read. The most important thing that we can ever offer to God is ourself. Amen. Right. And that involves everything. Anything that has anything to do with me involves me worshiping God with an offering of myself. We are willing to give up the things we believe are important to honor God. Now we, uh, we, we tend to think of that, this right here and I took several weeks to already talk about how this is important. This is this are linked together. Alright? And we know that. And I don't want to be misunderstood here today, but I just want to remind us of something. All of us. Jesus was the one that said, if you love father, mother, aunt, uncle, sister, brother, more than me. What was he saying? Sometimes the things that are important to you will have to be secondary when it comes to me. Family is important to all of us. But in my worship to God, he has the preeminence over everything and over every one in my life. Our calendars. <laughs> I 
I've had evangelists before, even before I pastored here, they come and say, hey, you know, they're always hunting there. They got a hinted man or they're not getting paid, okay? I say, well, uh, let's go ahead and put that on the calendar. You know why they do that? Because they know if it's not on the calendar, it ain't going to happen. How many times have we all tried to get Brother Robert and I, we've been trying to go eat for uh, two or three years now. But if it don't go on the calendar, it don't get done. Well, our calendars has got to start revolving around God and not God around our calendar. See, it's got backwards in this day that we live in now. But our elders understood this, that the calendar revolves around God and not God around our calendar. Can I get an amen, amen today? Amen. Talking about worship. Talking about holiness. Unto God. God wants us to give to him. Not out of duty alone. But out of love. When we humble ourselves to God. By willingly giving of our time. To work for his kingdom. Giving our resources to fund the furtherance of his kingdom. And blessing others with the blessings that we have received. These are all forms of worship of our king. Again, our greatest gift is ourselves. We are called to give our lives. In the Christmas story, we see a beautiful picture of the characters laying down themselves at the feet of the Messiah. The shepherds left their sheep. You don't have a shepherd without sheep. But they left their sheep to praise God. The wise men laid down possessions and worship. But others in this story laid aside much more. As a young unmarried girl, Mary had everything to lose at Gabriel's announcement. Her reputation. Her marriage. Her prospects. Her whole future was on the line. She could have been shamed by her society, shamed by her family, and shamed by her betrothed. But despite all of these factors, Mary, in an act of humility and great faith, responded, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, let it be according unto thy word. Luke chapter 1, verse 38. I'll just take a few moments here and, and explain to us, and I may come back to this in a couple of weeks because I was actually going to. This is how holiness works. When Jesus had the conversation with Nicodemus, Nicodemus asked the question, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? How can the outside go back to the inside? And Jesus told him, it doesn't work like that. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Now let me explain. We get, we get it backwards. We think people's going to come into the church and then the church is going to work holiness into them. That's the outside working in. It don't work that way. It comes into the inside and then works out. And I'm going to prove it to you right now with the Virgin Mary. Mary had everything to lose. Okay? You know what people was going to think. This was a big deal in that culture of that day. Alright? Joseph had to have been tormented until the Lord spoke to him through the angel. Um, but she didn't understand it. What would you think? <laughs> would you have understood it? There's no way. Right? She didn't understand. But she said, nevertheless, let it be according to your word. And when she did that, the Holy Ghost, the new birth, the Holy Ghost overshadowed her when she said, let it be according to your word. I don't understand how I'm going to live like that. I don't understand how I'm going to become that. These people are weird. I don't understand it. But nevertheless, let it be according to your word, God. And when that entered into her heart, the Holy Ghost overshadowed her. And it birthed something inside of Mary's womb. 
And that word that she accepted and said, I don't understand, but let it be according to your word. It burned inside of her and become flesh. And then the word of God was fleshed out. The spirit become humanity, Brother Rich, and was lived out. And that's how holiness works. It's birthed inside of us. And then it becomes fleshed out. Joseph also had a lot at stake by obeying God and taking Mary as his wife. What would society say if they found out Mary was pregnant? Remember, the Bible says he was going to put her away privately. What would they say if Joseph married her anyway? Joseph and Mary weren't asked to give up possessions, but they were asked to give their very selves. Mary laid down her reputation, and Joseph, his manly pride, they were willing to give up their desires and plans so that God's plan could be fulfilled. We like to give to those we love. And for some, so much so that we would be willing to give all. A husband would offer up his life to save his wife. A mother... Now notice it don't go the other way around. <laughs> a mother would give her life if it meant her children could live. Soldiers would sacrifice themselves for their country. We are willing to lay down our lives for those that we love most. But what are we willing to give for our Savior? Think about it. The Apostle Paul was the one that said, for a good man, some would be willing to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were yet vile sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus gave up his life to die on the cross. As his followers, we are called to give up our lives as well, not in death yet, but in our life. When we humble ourselves by surrendering everything, we act on our faith and on our experience to truly worship our God. Everything that hath breath, the Bible admonishes to praise Him. But God is seeking worshipers to worship Him in spirit and in truth. This is what holiness truly is. We are separated unto our betrothed as the bride of Christ collectively and to our heavenly father individually. We are committed to Jesus as our kinsman redeemer and pick up our cross daily to follow after him, our best friend and our big brother. You ever had a friend that, they, I had some friends that would get me into mischief because I was following them. Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I'm coming to a close, Sister Amber. This story is told in Angela Hunt's classic, The Tale of Three Trees. Once upon a mountaintop, Three little trees dreamed of what they wanted to be one day. The first tree longingly said, I want to be the most beautiful treasure chest, covered with gold and be filled with precious stones. The second tree thought and said, I'd be a strong ship, traveling mighty waters and carrying kings. The third tree simply said, I want to grow tall and point people toward heaven. Years passed and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter chose the first tree, and with a swoop of his shining axe, the tree fell. Now I shall be made into a beautiful chest, the first tree said. The second woodcutter approached, and with a swoop of his axe, the second tree fell. Now I shall sell mighty waters, said the second tree. Although the third tree once stood proudly with the swoop of the axe, 
the third tree fell too. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter took her to a carpenter's shop. But the carpenter fashioned the tree into a feed box for animals where she was coated with sawdust and filled with hay. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took him to the shipyard. But the once strong tree was sawed into a simple fishing boat. The third tree was confused when the woodcutter took her into strong beams and left her in the lumber yard. Years passed. One night, golden starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby into the feed box. Though it was not a cradle, suddenly the first tree knew she was holding the greatest treasure in the world. One evening, a tired traveler and his friends crowded into an old fishing boat. A storm arose and the little boat knew he did not have the strength to carry so many passengers through wind and the rain. The tired traveler stood up and stretched out his hand and said, Peace! And the storm stopped as quickly as it had begun. Suddenly, the second tree knew he was carrying the king of heaven and of earth. One Friday morning, the third tree was yanked from the woodpile and carried through an angry, jeering crowd. Soldiers nailed a man's hands to her. But afterward, on the third day, the third tree knew she had served a great purpose now, every time people would think of the third tree, they would think of God. Sometimes our dreams don't match up with God's plans. We may even forget our dreams. But when we worship God by giving our all to Him, our lives will have so much more value because they will be used for His kingdom and for His glory. Will you stand with me today?